Once upon a time, there were two little girls named Deb. One little girl grew up to be a preacher, while the other grew up to be a pagan, and they both grew up to be the very best of friends. Join the preacher and the pagan as they take a fresh look at Christianity from the inside out and the outside in. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> yeah, sure, I don't know, but welcome to the Preacher and the Pagan. Hi, Deb Sutter. How the heck are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Spring is starting to sprung up here. I'm, I'm loving it. How about uh, you down there? It is the slow descent into madness that we call summer in Arizona. Mm. <sighs> but you know what? It's still cool, so I am not, I, I do not despair just yet. Let's let's identify this. We are the preacher and the pagan. I'll let you. We are the preacher and the pagan. Yep. Um, (laughs) And our talk. Yeah. Is we're having an interesting start to the day this morning. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the women in the Gospels specifically. Oh, okay. Groovy. Not the entire New Testament because there's a whole other host of women, um, but we're talking the first century women who are named in the Gospels. You know, I was a number of years ago when I was um, I was in Germany. I was uh, sitting beside this very very polite German man, and he was telling me uh, that he was surprised by my my area of focus because there weren't that many women in the Bible. And after me listing names for two or three minutes, he just looked at me, said, and put his hands up and said, okay, okay, I'm wrong. You win. Uh, it just, it, it, it amazes me that people are so ignorant of how many women were involved with the beginning of Christianity. And I think that's two parts. One is that a whole lot of male preachers ignored them. But I think also because we, we were bombarded by the message that Christianity is only patriarchy. And we don't hear about all the women who were actually completely equal in number to um, uh, responsibility of the men and how many of them there actually were. And a lot of them had deep theological discussions with Jesus, too. They weren't just kind of fly by night um, uh, oh, look, we'll name someone and we'll move on. I mean, some of these people really challenged him. In fact, Jesus was challenged two major times in in the uh, the Gospels where he actually was put into silence. And that was by two women. Good. So you're you're answering a question already I had uh, in the back of my head because, you know, you talk. We've talked before about how important the women were in the early church. And, you know, we talk about their, you know, the, the wealthy widows funding things and, and and letting them use their homes. But the, it almost lends the impression that women were the ones, you know, making sure everybody got fed, making sure everybody was getting a place to sleep while they were on the road and all of that. And women the one men were the one having the deep theological discussions. So it really makes me feel good that you're saying this because the women weren't just keeping the household running while the men folk discussed theology. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, if there's a, a general gendered theme in the Gospels, especially the Synoptic Gospels, is that the men were idiots and the women understood. <clears throat> they were the ones that had the uh, had the uh, uh, the sense of what was going on and they asked the deeper questions. So yeah. if that is the case, I know that in the Council of Nicaea, they went through and they pulled out a whole heck of a lot of Gospels that were not made into the final version of the Bible. How I've, I've heard of the Gospel of Mary. Were there other Gospels written by women who were uh, or attributed to women that were just simply knocked out by the Council of Nicaea? Okay, first of all, I'm going to challenge you on the Council of Nicaea. I'll have to look that up, but I don't think that was one of the conversations they had. Um, uh, the the canon was open. No, no, that's that's perfectly fine. I don't know when it happened. I, I just don't think it was that intentional. Um, the only gospel that we have by a woman is the Gospel of Mary, um, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Um, all of the apostles are considered to have 
written a gospel. And most of those show up like, like third century. So they're, they're not even original content. Um, and I'm not sure about Mary of Magdalene, the, the gospel of Mary. I think that might show up in the, in the second or third century too. So a lot of these books are just removed for, for pure historicity. Um, okay. they were, they were written after the fact and had an apostle's name slapped on them. Um, okay. so they're very different from the synoptics that way in that they were actually written in the first century. I know that what you're describing here is not really the, what <laughs> most Christians are living with today with women, right. very strong theological positions within the church. Can you give us a sort of a timeline of how we went from there to here? Okay. Well, um, the first few centuries, uh, or the first few generations, rather, had women very strongly involved. You can see that in the Gospels. They talk about the first century, or first generation. Paul's letters talk about the second generation. By the time we get into the letters of Timothy and Peter, we're already third generation, and we can see the anti-women sentiment starting to creep back in, which was a wider-held sentiment, especially in uh, Greek culture, which is what most of these um, came out of it that, uh, eventually, um, where they believed that women were just lesser men. They, they weren't complete, that they were very much body, and the ultimate goal was to be a, a head thing, which is, is what how the Greeks saw men. Um, but it wasn't until the middle of the second century, I believe, when they actually started to write documentation to push women aside and to silence women. And as I might remind people, if it wasn't happening, no one would have talked about it. So obviously it was it was going on. And we kind of have that increasing shutting down of women, um, and then a major leap in that area when um, Rome finally uh, became the center of the church in the, the fourth century, late third, fourth century, uh, where the, the, the balance of power had shifted. Um, and then you take another jump to um, the early Middle Ages, where there was still a lot of women in the um, fourth and fifth and sixth um, centuries who were in leadership and the church trying to shut down all of that. And one of my favorites is, um, I think I've mentioned on this podcast before, it's a, it's a Bishop Otto. And I think he was Frankish, but I can't, I can't swear to that, who wrote a letter saying, of course we have women running ministry. We don't have enough men. And just a couple of years later, he writes, oh, we've never had women in ministry here. Um, so there, there's also this element of practicality in it. And there is a number of of um, statues and funeral markers and uh, stained glass windows and um, mosaics that actually acknowledge women in leadership. And they're pretty well there up until Martin Luther. So we really don't have a complete shutout of women in ministry until we hit the revel the um, um, the Reformation. Uh, and Martin Luther and, and his gang went after the convents. See, a lot of a lot of these women went into the convents and they were considered one of the greatest places of learning and theology at the time. A lot of the mystics like um, Hildegard and, and um, uh, oh, I can't think of the names offhand, um, Meg Child and, and um, uh, uh, they had they had correspondences with kings, with um, uh, with popes. Uh, with bishops, like they were, they were a huge center of, of intellectual um, debate and development. And um, then Martin Luther decided that a woman's role was strictly that of mother. And he and his people actually actively destroyed women's um, convent living and tore down the buildings, um, forced a lot of these women to marry. Uh, and after about 1700s, you start to see women emerge again in leadership of different places. So it's only really a two or three hundred years where the church successively shut, successfully shut down women, but they certainly tried right from the third generation. Um, and that you can see in the Bible. That, my friend, is a very concerning thing to hear. Yeah. Um I mean, it took them 2,000 years, but 
you know, almost 2000 years, but as, as a pagan, you know, there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of woman centered pay, uh, pagan systems and, you know, there's a lot to be learned from the story of women in Christianity, especially if you're in a more woman centric religion, because mm-hmm. yep. th- give them an inch, they'll swim all over you, you know? Yeah. The men folk. Yeah, pretty much. No. Yeah. You but it's do- not just the men. We also have to acknowledge internalized misogyny. I was watching a, um, a, a Roman Catholic missionary a couple of years ago go on and on about Jerome and translating the Vulgate. Well, Jerome was not the only one. He had a partnership with a woman named Paula. She was the actual linguist and academic. Jerome was just the one who made the language a little fancier, a little more poetic in the Vulgate. Um, and she and this woman was just smoothing over a, a significant mm-hmm. piece of Christian history. So women are also some of the worst enemies of uh, of perpetuating the, the understanding that women were very essential in the creating of the church. And I, as a minister, I can go into any congregation and I can promise you, if You'll the congregation her. is heavily women focused that congregation has a better chance of surviving than if it's men top heavy yeah just the way it works women were responsible and and in missionary situations they were responsible for sharing the gospel in a whole lot of places so i the the you i i did not know about martin luther actively targeting convents this is new to me because well as a a former you get a side of reformation really get a whole a lot of uh preaching on the martin luther and the history um it's just no. not something we would have gotten but i have to ask you because and i don't know if this is really your specialty area but did the women fight back and who oh, yes. were the, oh, yes. who were the leaders oh, yes. who were trying to maintain the, the 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 status of women in the church as these attacks came well, I mean, you're not getting organized marches and protests and signs well, and that no, kind of, of stuff not. that that we understand. Um, but one of the the grand ironies um, is these men were not terribly reflective people, and so they would have these like Luther was one. Um, he would have these grand pronouncements about how women can't do this and should stay in the kitchen and have children, whatever else. His number one advisor was his wife that he talks about quite, quite, uh, quite freely. So um, these guys, I mean, it goes back to Aristotle, who would, who would talk about the inferiority of women, but his, his main um, scientific counterpart was his wife, who was well educated in her own skills. So we have, it, it's kind of, um, the, Women never disappeared. They used the power they had to continue influencing how the church developed. And often it was through convincing the men to do certain things. Um, so that's that's where that power is mostly seen um, for a couple of hundred years. But we've got women who are writing extensive um, letters back and forth with people Um uh, just because the Germans got rid of a lot of the, or that well, they weren't Germans at the time, but a lot of Martin Luther's folks got rid of, of a lot of the convents didn't mean that the Southern uh, European convents were destroyed. So you have a lot of women still going forth through the, through the middle ages, um, traveling and teaching, um, writing. Um, but a lot of this stuff because it was suppressed and, and, you know, you give, as you said, you give, um, give patriarchy an inch. It will do its best to suppress women. Um, a lot of these writings are just now, I'm not sure they're being discovered or rediscovered, uh, but we're now being able to see certain things and see patterns. And I think that has a lot to do with women being more engaged in telling the history of the church because women ask different questions and they follow through with different evidence um, so we're discovering new things. Um, but that's kind of how the women had their say, essentially, was um, um, working to the best they could to cater to the men and encourage them in their thought process as they went. Um, you also have a lot of women actively involved 
um, in social justice causes. I mean, the early Quakers, that was heavily women influenced. Um, the the that, early that, that, abolition was heavily ever women influenced. So there's, it depends on where you look. Okay. If you're looking at the monarchic traditions, women were silenced more. If you're looking at the low church traditions that came out of the Protestant um, schisms, then you probably see more women involved. Okay. Um, so getting back to our specific type topic, women yeah. in the Bible, uh, do you see any specific types of women who are featured in the Bible or who are mentioned uh, more than others? Mm. Yeah, there are three essential categories, and, and I've restricted this to the Gospels because after about 30 names, I thought we needed to leave um, the, the, the letters of Paul and onward to, uh, to another conversation if we want to. Um, the Gospels themselves seem to have women in three categories. So there are the named women. Then there's the women who have a particular characteristic, like they're from a certain town or they're, they have a certain attribute, like the woman who's, who's bleeding. And then there are the women who are associated by relationship to um, primarily a man, but not exclusively. So these are the three groups of people that are, um, are named, uh, three, three groups of women that are named in um, the Christian scriptures. Uh, you've got your favorites that keep coming up again and again, of course, Mary Magdalene. She's in um, all four of the gospels. Gospels. Um, the sisters Martha and Mary, they're in two of the Gospels. Um, Elizabeth uh, and Anna are very significant people who spend time with um, with Mary of Nazareth. That's that's in Luke. Um, and then we have um, references to Jesus' sister, Peter's um, Peter's mother-in-law. Um, the Seraphonician women, which is one of the women that challenges Jesus, and he he has to basically acknowledge he's wrong. That's the whole discussion about the, the dogs eating the crumbs. Um, both she and her daughter are mentioned. Um, then we've got the mother of James and John. She's the mother that went up to them and, and to Jesus and said, can my sons be on the right hand and left hand? And, and uh, that gives Jesus a whole opportunity to basically say, you, you don't get what I'm doing here, are you? You don't want your sons this close to me at this stage in my ministry. This is towards the end. Um, uh, then we have uh, Mary, the mother of... Um, uh, James and Jose. She was at the uh, at the cross. Um, uh, the wife of Cleophas, um, Roman official, wives of Pilate. Um, so they they kind of populate through um, the Gospels in various places. The Samaritan woman who um, uh, met Jesus at the well and challenged him about living water. The uh, woman caught in adultery, where Jesus says, uh, "You who has sinned, cast the first stone." Um, the women who um, who anointed Jesus' feet, um, who may have had, um, may have been a prostitute, maybe not. Uh, she's part of the whole conflation and confusion of the whole Mary Magdalene being a prostitute debunkle that we talked about some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're women encounter, and then we know that women paid for a lot of the ministry, a lot of food. Uh, there's at one point where... Um, I can't remember which gospel it is. I think it's Luke that says uh, is the feeding of the 5,000. And then there's a line at the, at the bottom that says not including women and children. So means that there are 5,000 plus, plus, plus uh, people that were fed in that story. So um, you just have, have women being very much a part of what is going on with the ministry of Jesus. And it's, it's a shame because it, as an outsider, the Christian church looks extraordinarily patriarchal. And mm -hmm. maybe one of the problems that communication and cooperation between Christians and non-Christian women is that so much of this, I mean, I, I was raised Catholic, but hearing you say this, it's, it's almost, it's almost shocking to me in some ways because just to have it laid out that way. But it's not shocking that it's never put the way you just did, saying, hey, look, this person, this person, woman, 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 woman. Women were important. For some reason, all those stories are there, but that message is never really being pushed. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, I'm, I'm always going to come back and say it. It's because a lot of people in leadership want women and not just Christian leadership, but systematically Western culture do not want women to realize the power that they have. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Because it serves them well to keep us uh, fighting against each other. It serves them well to keep us internalized misogyny and and I say them, I mean the structures of power that mm-hmm. are specifically out there. And yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I live in the United States in the 21st century, so I will tell you right now, all you have to do is look on the nightly news, and there are still women who are actively seeking to harm other women because Mm -hmm. of whatever, because they can get a grasp at some sort of power or because they can get some sort of validation from doing. Yeah. And it's, and a lot of these people, I would imagine kind of cloak themselves under the veil of Christianity, making them doubly disingenuous. Because if you actually know your Christian history, I mean, no, no, it, not the, not the, the superficial version that, that a lot of people think is, is Christian history, but history, but if you actually know it, um, you will see that women are the, are very significant players in the entirety of, uh, of the early Christian tradition. In fact, the biggest announcements, Annunciation and Resurrection, were both made to women. Mm-hmm. And women were the ones that carried on these two basic pillars of, um, of the beginning and the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. That's not nothing. And, you know, I, 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 can, I can almost hear the wheels ticking in. This is not wanting to say, oh, women are more important or women Mm -mm. this is to say that you know what it doesn't it (laughs) acknowledging the importance of women in the early church as well as in the bibles the gospels and as well as in the the modern church whether it's christianity or any faith doesn't take away from the importance of men so why is it so emotionally charged to say hey women are here we're doing work we have ideas we have thoughts and questions why does it hurt it so much why is it so threatening oh jeepers i I think dissertations are written on that topic i honestly don't know if a good answer has ever come out of that there is there's something with the the way male church leaders have only paid attention to men and perpetuated that and created a structure that blocks out women. Um, and and they've hurt the church as a result. Some of the, the most incredible moments of knowledge and insight have come from women. If you look at the mystic tradition, some of these women are basically responsible for forming a good deal of the progressive theology that we just take for granted. Um, It it didn't, the, the, the number of women and because women in history, like I am, are doing the work of recovery. um, We are starting to see that there's actually fewer men who have influenced the development of the church than there have been women. Um, Now I can't give you numbers because that's a, that's kind of an instinct call, but, um, but there are, significantly less big names of men and I think part of that is how the church initially appealed to certain groups of people so I'm looking at this list of names of uh, you know Mary of Nazareth Mary Magdalene Anna Elizabeth Joanna Martha Mary of Bethany Herodesia uh, Mary the mother of James and John Joanna the wife of, of Huzzah Susanna, Mary the wife of Cleophas. These are all women who had political uh, when we were looking at these were these are men without economic power. And one of the Romans at the time, um oh early three hundreds, and I cannot remember his name offhand, um, stood um Celsus, that's it. Um he s- stood in the uh in the house of um, or in the Roman chamber and he said Christianity is or Christ followers are only those who are slaves and women and children um, trying to dismiss altogether who was actually involved in the church. But that's a beautiful snapshot 
of who was actually making it happen. And it's not until Rome, the government, accepts Christianity as their official religion that men start to really double down on pushing women out um, and try to make themselves the most in, important part. And so much of it is just That's familiar. The, yeah, just the innate um, nature of patriarchy where men are so insecure and they have to basically out gorilla each other almost and um, and then women kind of get lost in that but women thank heavens never did shut up so they're along the edges as I said it's just a matter of of looking and a lot of historians haven't bothered looking so now that we've got a couple of generations of women historians who are looking these stories are, are flushing out and filling out a lot more I don't know where I heard this um, quote but I always loved it uh, somebody said if you see the word anonymous nine times out of ten, you're talking about a woman. Yes, I think that was a, an American poet. I can't remember her name right off the top of my head. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. I yeah. love that quote. But yeah. you know, so it's it's an eternal struggle to deal with men's weak egos, women's internalized misogyny, whether it's in politics, whether it's in religion, whether it's in just social issues. We're, we're, I, I think at some point in the game, women will not have to be having these conversations. I, I don't so. think you and I will live to see that point in the game, but <laughs> I still have faith Probably that it's going to happen someday. No. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago making some comment about how Easter Sunday is as much Mary Magdalene's story as it is Jesus' story. This yeah. one guy absolutely tried to rip me. It's like, dude, seriously, it's okay to share the spotlight, you know? We still it's recognize right. Jesus as the Christ, but Mary Magdalene was the messenger. She's the apostle to the apostle. Even the Pope finally figured that one out over, just a few years ago. This is significant. And there should not be a reason why we have to not celebrate women just because men want to see men wherever they are. And and I'm, you know, I'm heartened by more men who want to hear these stories or like this, my story in the beginning, this German man who, who backed up and he said, I was wrong. You know, I, that's a good start. But are they going to now start teaching about women? I don't know. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's an eternal struggle, you know. It's I think it's just something about being a woman on the planet Earth. Um, mm. But you know, at least we're working towards getting that message out. And uh, there's so many other things that we have to work on. So we'll just keep put this on the pile and nap when we can right yeah, that's right <laughs> yep oh my gosh so the work's getting done if you had one thing to say to our audience about women in the gospels if you could put it into an elevator speech what would it be women are the intellectual base the moneyed followers the women of influence the people of influence in the entirety of the Gospels. As much as they are about Jesus, and rightly so, it is always the women who make that ministry happen, um, who encourage further discussion. The men are playing catch up all this time, and not to not to dismiss them, but they don't have the intellectual curiosity that women do. So I, I think go back and read the Gospels for the women who keep pushing the development of the faith of the belief um, and look for them in a lot of places. You will notice when the 70 are sent out, there is no gender assigned. There are women and men in that group. Of course, we're, we're restricted by the binary, but there are women and men in all of this. Women very much were part of how the gospel got spread in the earliest generations. And I think that's a good message for all women, whether they identify as Christian or pagan or any other religion or no religion, go out there, be part of it, ask the difficult questions. And when you get that 
that that blowback just you know stand strong because it is the intellectual curiosity it's a spiritual curiosity that is going to help us start fixing some of the problems that we're facing with uh, on a daily basis Mm -hmm. absolutely i love it I love our conversations, my friend, uh, but I think we're running out yes. of time. So Yeah, I think so. Well, thank you very much for uh, for coming on and doing this. This is a topic that's very close to my heart. Absolutely. And I and I I, I kind of got through it without, you know, slurring my words and falling flat. But um, Yeah, you might want to go to sleep. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Deb Sutter. I'm Deb Bodwin. And we will talk to you guys next time. Thanks for watching, listening to The Preacher and the Pagan. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Bye. Bye, my friend. You've been listening to The Preacher and the Pagan with Deborah Suttard and Deborah Bodwin. This podcast is a two-lady podcast production in conjunction with The Barefoot Evangelist. Our producer and sound editor is Catherine Gordon. Our theme music was composed by Deborah Bodwin. You can reach us at thepreacherandthepagan at gmail.com or by visiting our website at barefootevangelist.ca forward slash podcast.